I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about neurosteroids, specifically zoranolone. So the take-home message is that recently in August of 2023, the FDA did approve zoranolone under the brand name Zerzuve to treat postpartum depression. This is only the second drug licensed to treat postpartum depression, and the predecessor 2019 had a very niche market. We'll get into why later. So the studies that have been published, it's only a small number of studies, but the effects were so robust that Zoran alone very rapidly within three days was effective treating postpartum depression. So it works quickly, it works effectively, and side effects in these studies were pretty minimal. I'll get into what those were. So it looks robustly effective for postpartum depression. And there is very enticing evidence that it may well be helpful for a much broader range of depression. There have been a handful of studies published which showed somewhat similar results, but not as strong statistical results. So the FDA did not, in August of this year, approve it for general major depression. Postpartum depression is defined as a major depression, so you can't just have mildly upset or a moderate tearfulness or other mild symptoms, you need to meet full criteria for a major depression that's occurring in either the last trimester or more commonly in the first month after delivery. Postpartum depression occurs right now worldwide in about 17% of women pregnancies. That's a incredibly high number. That makes it the number one most common serious complication. It is the most common time in the lifespan of a woman or her to become depressed. On the other hand, what's important to remember is even women who have been previously depressed, so their rate is higher than that 17% baseline, the majority of women, even who have a previous history of depression, do not become depressed in the postpartum, but it is still the most likely time for depression to arise. There's a whole host of both physiologic factors that this could be going on. So there are tremendous hormonal fluctuations at the end of pregnancy. So during pregnancy, progesterone, estrogen, and there are other certainly hormones that are rising pretty steadily during the course of pregnancy and then plummet dramatically after delivery. Testosterone actually does also, and the woman found at lower levels in either of those for most of the pregnancy, does rise to a slight amount and does dip somewhat after delivery, but not nearly as dramatically. So there's biological factors going on. There's also clearly huge social factors and stressors. Even if you are highly desiring wanting a baby, it's a new responsibility. There's changes in your role as a parent, often relation change in relationship with other people in the household, major competitor for time, effort, brain space if you are trying to work and be a mother at the same time. We have a need for a medication that works quickly and effectively. And the other interesting thing about both Rexanolone, the previously approved drug, and Zoranolone, these are neurosteroids. One is, there are two things. They are a novel mechanism, so we didn't have neurosteroids in psychiatry. They have been experimenting and using it for neurosteroids for treating seizure disorders. Two, the neurosteroids, among other things I'll get to in a minute, are working primarily on GABA A receptor systems. I'll get into that in a moment. Three, this is the first time in the history of developing antidepressants where we were targeting a specific mechanism of action and looking for drugs that could work or help along those lines. So previous history of discovering antidepressants, starting out with the first ones were actually monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclics that were original forms of those drugs were used for other things, including anti-tuberculosis action, and it was serendipitously found that they worked for depression, and other drugs that worked in a similar way on their particularly serotonin and norepinephrine systems were tried. So even the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they weren't designed, let's go look for a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It said, oh, drugs with serotonin reuptake action seem to be helpful with depression. Let's build lots of them to compete against each other. Here, this is a mechanism-based 
self-discovery process, not a serendipitous one. So the mechanism that people were looking at was presence or what do neurosteroids do in the brain and neurosteroids, our basic building block for all our steroids is cholesterol. So cholesterol is not just some evil, bad, nasty molecule that clogs up your arteries. Cholesterol is an important component directly in products it's metabolized to in cell membranes, increasing cell main fluidity, building block for a number of steroid hormones, including testosterone, which we recently talked about, estrogen, progesterone, and a whole host of neurosteroids. So the neurosteroid that's probably been looked at most, sex hormone, progesterone, is metabolized to allopregnanolone, which is has been extensively studied, seems to influence how brains get wired, and some of that is directly through its influence on GABA. So we hear and talk a lot about serotonin, dopamine, maybe norepinephrine. Those are all sort of familiar to people. What the hell is GABA? Well, there's at least 10 times as much GABA as dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine neurons put together. So all of those well-known neurons are tiny, tiny systems starting at the base of the brain, spreading out all over. But numerically, each less than probably 1% of the neurons in the brain are using serotonin, dopamine, or norepinephrine primarily as a neurotransmitter. In contrast, the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the human brain and most other mammals, probably 20 to 25% of neurons in the brain are primarily GABA neurons. Neurosteroids, including allopregnanolone, are what are called allosteric modulators. So allosteric means they are not binding to the exact same site as GABA does at this receptor, but they're binding at a different site on the molecule and then changing the configuration of the molecule. And it should be worth pointing out that alcohol and the benzodiazepines of Valium, Al Valium, Ativan, Xanax-like drugs are also allosteric modulators of the GABA-A receptor system. So the GABA system itself is an inhibitory system, but it is managing and it's balancing out the whole excitatory and inhibitory balance in the brain, reinforce what circuits get strengthened and which circuit, what connectivity gets weakened in the brain. So it's a overall powerful modulatory force. Allopregnanolone levels were correlated with how tightly your default mode network is wired and correlated with levels of or frequency and severity of postpartum depression. Testing does show that both of these drugs, brexanolone and zoranolone, are changing or affecting GABA neurotransmission in the brain. Historically, their mode of action has been thought to be primarily binding to the receptors on the surface of cells and then being pulled into the nucleus of cells and then changing which genes get activated and which get shut off. So that may be some substantial part of what is going on with these two drugs. So in 2019, brexanolone, and brexanolone is just a proprietary form of allopregnanolone itself, it was approved. It works really well for postpartum depression. So why weren't we talking about this way back then? Why isn't it widely used? Two big factors. One is it requires a 60-hour infusion. So you're ramping up the dose, but you have an IV in you for two and a half days. That's either a clinic or a hospital stay. And they price the drug itself separate from the costs of being in a clinic or hospital at $34,000. So not pocket change, therefore not widely accepted. So part of the need for the IV infusion is a relatively short half-life and steroids are fat-soluble molecules that can be partly at least broken down by our digestive system. So consuming them, at least the allopregnanolone, brexanolone form, wasn't a viable option. Before 2019, when brexanolone was approved, they've already been working on other neuroactive steroids that are allopregnanolone-like molecules. And seranolone was at the top of the list of what seemed to be working. So when the FDA approved it, there were two very well-done studies using it for postpartum depression, using it in the 30 to 50 milligram range, taking it just once a day in the evening with a fatty meal, two weeks of once a day medication in the studies similar to what was shown previously with brexanolone, 
by day three, measurable substantive drops in depression rating scales. Not just a drop from the individual space line, but better drop than placebo group induced. Continued dropping through the course of the 14 days of treatment. And then patients were followed for a full month or four, four weeks following that. And their depression stayed remitted. Those were full recovery or substantial improvement persisted. So the important things are, again, there was no withdrawal after the 14 days of the drug, while there would a longer delivery period or treatment period do, we don't know, but 14 days again, seems sufficient, even though all antidepressants are required to have a warning that they can cause suicidal ideation in both the postpartum depression studies, and I'll get in a moment to the major depression studies, not postpartum, no reports of suicidal ideation showed up, but the other lack of side effects is also positive. So no sexual side effects, no weight gain. I mean, these are relatively short trials. The side effects that we're seeing, the ones that were significantly in both brexanolone and zoranolone are similar. Some drowsiness, some dizziness in the range of 10 to 15% of people that was higher than the placebo group. Other side effects that have been thrown out in the popular press, yes, somewhere around 10 to 15% of people had diarrhea, nausea, headaches, UTIs, but most of those seem comparable to the placebo group. So drowsiness and dizziness seem to be the common ones. And there is a warning, don't go driving and you're taking this medication. At the same time that the postpartum depression studies were published, and again, the FDA found them adequate, and they are pretty impressive in terms of how quick the effect is, how different from the placebo group they are, has not yet been approved for major depression. So the major depression study was a larger group of people, not just women, similar profile. There was improvement starting with day three, but the statistical significance didn't reach statistical significance till about day 15. So the FDA said, yeah, this looks encouraging, but this is not robust enough, particularly given that we have other alternatives for treating depression. Yes, this is rapid. Yes, this looks good, but you need to do at least one more study and achieve greater statistical significance before we all prove it for depression. Interesting question is whether they're even going to pursue that route. And one is, once a drug is approved by the FDA, a doctor can write, write for it for any indication which they think the medical evidence supports it. So it's certainly legal and ethical if there's supportive evidence to write for medication for, again, any cause that seems appropriate. So a doctor could write this for non-postpartum depression. The question is, is a two-week course going to be sufficient? Do every six weeks need to redo it another two-week course? We don't know. We, again, no longer-term studies were done. Even though I mentioned the postpartum is a common time for women to get depressed, but there's clearly a much bigger market for depression than there is for postpartum depression, just more individuals, more time spent in that condition. But that doesn't mean they're going to pursue an indication. So one of the things I'm thinking of is when ProVigil Modafinil came on the market, they knew at that time that you know, they had studies, modafinil worked for a huge range of lethargy-inducing conditions. But modafinil only sought out a very narrow set of indications. They sought it out for narcolepsy. They sought it out for sleep work, shift circadian rhythm disorder. I might not have used the exact right words. And for sleep apnea, daytime fatigue, which wasn't resolved by CPAP machines. I checked GoodRx today to find out what Zoranolone has been priced at. GoodRx said we don't have any information, which is strange. So maybe it's not even fully in the marketplace because GoodRx is usually pretty quick. It's a good resource, by the way, for checking drug prices at different pharmacies. So again, the Brexanolone is priced at $34,000 per a, again, the single 60 hour infusion word in all the financial papers is that the companies are going to be charging close to $34,000 for the two week treatment for the oral pill. 
that to me suggests they are only, you know, trying to make a huge amount of money on a small number of patients rather than capture a big number of patients and not make much profit. Generic Prozac, Paxil, Zola, Celexa run about $200, $240 a year. If you insist or need on the brand name, you're spending close to $6,000 a year if you're paying that full market price. Trimplex, which is only a brand name drug at this point, so hasn't reached the end of its patent life and works in a different mechanism than anything else, is around $5,000 a year if you had to pay out of pocket. So maybe they're considering $34,000 for a round of Zoran alone. Some of this is speculative. We'll see what happens at the market. So that's, again, it does look like it's effective. I mean, it also highlights that there are almost certainly different mechanisms by which, at a neurochemical level, by which people become depressed. And this neurosteroid GABA A receptor pathway may only be a subset of the depressive market. A few studies looking at allopregnanolone, so the neurosteroid that your own body makes out of pregnant progesterone. The kids with ADHD actually have low levels of allopregnanolone. Ritalin, one of the things it does, actually seems to boost allopregnanolone. So it is not far-fetched that there may be either many kids with ADHD or maybe just a subset of kids with ADHD who may wind up benefiting from drugs like this. I've searched. I can't say nobody's doing any research. I haven't seen any specific studies looking at a drug like this, but there's, again, some basic preliminary work that suggests neurosteroids may be part of treating ADHD in the not-too-distant future. So I've run out of things to say. Stay healthy, stay happy, 